Uh, so hello everyone. I'm I'm here today with Jenny Old, uh, author of Innocent Nurses Abroad, and we're going to have Jenny give us a, a little bit of a discussion about the uh, the book itself, and then we'll have some interview questions uh, that come after that. So the first thing I'd like to do is introduce uh, Jenny with uh, Innocent Nurses Abroad, and could you uh, could you possibly tell us a little bit? about the book itself. Right. Uh, Innocent Nurses Abroad was my second book. I did things back to front, which was a bit stupid. I did McAllister and Back of Beyond, and then Innocent Nurses Abroad is actually a prequel. But I suppose I never took my writing very seriously, and I didn't think anyone would, apart from family would be interested. So Innocent Nurses Abroad was a, a wonderful period of time, just touches on my childhood in Deneloquin on a farm and then my boarding school and then nursing training in Melbourne, where I was, I can say a reluctant nurse because having been a good girl all my life, when I was allowed out of the Methodist Ladies College in Sydney, I rebelled and partied hard in the Riverina in those good old days. And uh, my mother booked me an appointment with the matron of the Alfred Hospital in Melbourne and said, you're going to be a nurse. Um, I said, oh, do I want to be a nurse? And she said, well, you have to do something. <laughs> so I found myself in front of this very severe matron and she asked me why I wanted to be a nurse. And I looked at my mother and she gave me that look as if to say, don't go there. And I said, because I like helping sick people and I was accepted. So I think I'm very lucky I wasn't born in this era where it takes a lot more to get a job or a position. Mm, mm, exactly. So it was a nursing training in the 1960s. So very different to now big public hospital, uh, very, very busy and um, the limitations, but the great friendships formed through nursing um, were just amazing. And then when we finally finished, um, four of us decided we were going to go off on the big overseas adventure and we booked on the Fair Star and we were down on D deck, which was sort of the porthole was sort of halfway sea level. <laughs> so we had to close it in rough weather, but we could sort of see the sea. Um, and four bunks in this little cabin. And we went by Cape Town because the sewers was closed at the time. Mm, conflict. Mm. And it took five weeks by Africa and the Canary Islands. And um, on that period of time, I actually fell in love with my husband 10 days before we left. Oh, wow. Which was a bit sudden and a bit intense. So I went reluctantly and he promised to be there when I returned. But I did have a shipboard romance. Oh, <laughs> it was during a wicked storm, a, a horrific storm off Cape Town, and you know, it really was quite frightening. Yes, yeah. And there was only a few people on board, and Ooh. that's when I met him. So. <laughs> So that threw the spanner in the work. So the book goes on from there and us being in London and working. And then we bought an old school bus with 14 different people and we converted it with aircraft seats. And that was our mode of transport to travel around Europe, um, right up into Norway, through Morocco, uh, through Eastern Germany, through Czech mm. Charlie. And oh, all wow. the so, I was so lucky. So that, that is basically um, the story of the adventures and the challenges and the stupid things we did and managed to get yeah. ourselves out of. Hence the name Innocent. It could be more naive. <laughs> <laughs> so it was fun to write. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, it, it's interesting when you um, kind of mentioned East Germany. Could, could you tell us a little bit about, as you say, Checkpoint Charlie? Because you, you see so many of these films about, you know, going into Germany and then coming out of East Germany um, and the difficulties that that ensue from that, you know, transition from a democracy to, a, to essentially a non-democracy. Can you tell us a little bit about that? That was actually amazing. Um, we were so lucky to actually have had the opportunity to go through Checkpoint Charlie. You had to get permits and things. Mm. But it was very confronting because um, Berlin was raging. There was, you know, there was American uh, military was situated there. So it was just party, party central. Mm. And then going through Checkpoint Charlie, we had to go through one at a time. And the guards just, just stared at us. It was... Yeah. 
And, you know, we were used to sort of smiling and saying hello, but they just glared at us for ages and looked at the photo and then finally stamped. So by the time we were all through, mm. we hopped in the bus and we had a, a map and we followed the map, which was along beside the wall where we were heading for Hitler's bunker. Mm. We went through some gates and um, next thing we were surrounded by, well, within a few minutes, we were surrounded by these jeeps with machine guns those soldiers and then the wall was beside us and they were all facing us pointing their guns at oh us oh my goodness and we just we sort of were a bit you know oh, this is a bit of a joke you know obviously we've gone into a, a prohibited area mm. and of course they didn't speak english we didn't speak german so we didn't know really what was happening until they marched off our three men the driver and the two guides they disappeared in a jeep and we were sort of goodness these guides these guards sorry with their guns on us and one of the girls sort of thought I'll, I'll better take a photo of this and one of the guards just grabbed her camera and smashed it on the ground oh we, this is serious so we started writing home dear mum and dad <laughs> <laughs> and we were stuck there for about three hours and they finally came back and then they escorted us around but oh truly being in east berlin was it was so eerie there was mm. The buildings were still bombed out. And at one stage we saw a tram coming down the street with a female driver and there's no people and just rattled down the street and it was really eerie. And yeah. we had to spend a certain amount of money when we were there, it was 10 shillings, which was a lot of money. Mm. Um, so we decided, we asked these people that were um, guiding us, traveling with us with their guns we said you know can we go to a hotel we thought the only way to spend 10 shillings was to go to a hotel and <laughs> buy drinks and food which we did <laughs> so we finally got out of there but going through east germany was really frightening and we didn't again naivety we didn't realize there was a time on you when you entered east germany to when you got through and departed mm. and we had a flat tire in the middle and we couldn't get the wheel nuts undone. And, and we were there for about three or four hours. Mm. So when we got to the checkpoint to go out, again, we were surrounded by machine guns and they made us unload the whole bus, everything. Mm. And even stripped the chairs out and stood us there. So we were there for several hours while they, you know, they actually speared our bars of soap. And it was amazing. <laughs> we just couldn't believe it. So we were so very pleased to leave East <laughs> Germany behind. So when you say speared the bar of soap, what, so what, what was the purpose of that? I, I have no idea. They had mirrors and they were going around under the bus and they made us tip all our toiletries. We only had one small bag each for this six months overseas, but mm. they made us tip all our toiletries out and they sort of had bayonets on the end of their guns and they were just spearing them. I, I don't know. That is, yeah, that's so bizarre. Um, yeah. Whether they were looking for explosives or, or yeah. something like that. For me, if I was in that situation, I'd be absolutely petrified. Um, it was, yeah, it was confronting. But again, I think we were so naive. We just thought, oh, we're bulletproof. We'll get out of here. <laughs> we did, thank goodness. <laughs> I'm glad, I'm glad you used that word again, um, naive. So, you know, the, the concept of innocent nurses abroad and that naivety. Um, so in, in terms of, the, you know, the book and the journey, what was the most naive uh, <laughs> thing that, that your group kind of got involved with? Um, probably that was one of them. But yeah. one that I personally uh, look back in horror is in Morocco. Mm. Uh, in uh, Marrakesh, where in those days it was quite innocent that um, in the camping grounds, and of course mm. we were a bit strange, we had two big army tents and we, we all looked a bit odd in this funny old school bus. <laughs> so it caused a lot of interest when we pulled into a camping ground. <laughs> but the local young men would come to the camping ground, obviously, to meet girls. Mm. And you know, we, we always went in, a, in groups, um, yes. but we were never, ever threatened, but, you know, went to haciendas and we were uh, serenaded by Spaniards and whatever. But in Marrakesh, um, this guy called Jamal came out to the camping ground and a couple of us went to his family home for dinner. Mm, mm. It was amazing sitting around on the floor and eating lamb with your fingers and whatever. Yeah. And he spoke French and I spoke a little bit of French, mm. but... I went to the big, the grand um, bazaar with him on my own. 
And, you know, he was introducing me to all these little stall holders who were offering me, you know, cans of Coke. Thank goodness I didn't drink them. But I look back at the slave, white slave trade was rampant then. Uh. <laughs> Think, my God. But anyway, I didn't think and I got back. I only think now how stupid yeah. it was. And when we drove off, he was riding his bike behind it, saying in French, will you marry me? Will you marry me? Like, Four days in a proposal. That was pretty good. But, yeah, we did. Um, I think just with this old bomb of a bus, it just kept breaking down, things happening. Mm. We just managed to, um, we went over the St. Goddard's Pass in Switzerland. There were no tunnels then. Yes. If we ever got over that and back down in that old bum of, bum of a bus on there. <laughs> so, yeah, just when I look back now, when I was writing it, I thought, oh, how stupid, how stupid you were. <laughs> exactly. Because it, it's, I guess it's one of those things that when, when you're in the thick of it and you've got all these emotions that are kind of, uh, coming to the forefront and there's that adrenaline that you really don't think in a risk averse fashion do you it's just sort of like no I'm in the experience now uh, and it's only the hindsight where you you look back and you're like oh my goodness I was very close to something you know exactly. awful kind of like occurring and as you say ending up in the white, white slave trade is not where people <laughs> kind of want to want to end up especially in areas such as as you say Makarash and, and throughout uh, throughout Europe um so yeah that's that's absolutely amazing so um with um I want to go back to East Berlin a little bit and that transition uh, on on either side so you know when you I take it you went from West Germany into East uh, Berlin, East Germany. And then where did you come out at the other side? Um, do you know, I can't even remember where we came out the other side. Um, I really can't remember. It was part of, still part of Germany. It would have been probably part of Bavaria or something. Bavaria. Or, oh, okay. Okay. Yes. And so that, that transition, you kind of like when you, when you go from freedom to tyranny, and to freedom again, you know, how emotionally, how, how did you feel when you left East Berlin? Uh, it was really with a great deal of sadness for those people. Mm. Uh, I think one of the most poignant and, and tragic things we saw was as we were going through Checkpoint Charlie, there was a hill on both sides and there were families mm. standing on the hill and waving to their family on the other side. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. That was just heartbreaking. Mm, and of mm. course, hearing of the people who were shot trying to get across the wall was just amazing. It was all floodlit and there was barbed wire and there's guard dogs and machine guns. But apparently quite a lot of the guards actually let some people go through. You know, they purposely didn't shoot them. But uh, a, lot, a lot of people lost their lives. And just having been in West Berlin, the city, which was just vibrant, there were nightclubs, there were restaurants, there were, I went to dinner, dinner at the top of a, a town, you know, revolving restaurant, everything was just buzzing. And just to go through that checkpoint and then yeah. horror and this, we only saw a few people and they looked so sad. Mm, and even in mm. the hotel where we were, there was some um, young men there and they were, we were sort of speaking in broken English. And the one question they asked were, or two questions, what is London like and what is um, um, Sydney like? They were mm. two questions they wanted to ask. And then somebody must have walked in because all of a sudden they just disappeared you know they just melted away and you thought oh this is so sad and the beautiful opera house that was bombed and mm, holes mm. in the road so to come out the other side again gratitude of what we have and what we had yeah yeah because i i love what you kind of you know you're bringing to the forefront is you go into berlin east berlin and then there's this lack of of conversation mm -hmm. and, and I think a lot of that stems from the politics of, of mm -hmm. where you were and the ubiquitousness of the Stasi so there's this real kind of am I being recorded who's listening to my conversation and then his foreigners I want to ask them a question but as you say someone comes in and they just vanish 
so uh, sad. It's terrible. And the other mm. thing that we found in the villages of both sides, well, mainly West Germany, were the villages, once they knew we were Australian, we had a flag on the back, they were constantly apologising for the war. And oh, yeah. I'm not really sad because it wasn't their fault. Mm, um, mm. They were saying, we are so sorry, we are so sorry. Oh, and then at the Brandenburg gates, I remember seeing a march past and they did the goose step and, mm. you know, you could hear this creaking leather and it was, it just brought back, you know, what yeah. people had gone through the fear that they had. Mm. Exactly, exactly, exactly. What an astounding yeah. and, and, as you say, eerie experience to, to kind of have. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm going to, they're going to talk about uh, a little bit of a different thing now. So you crossed the Sahara as well. Yes, we so, did. <laughs> so how was that? Could, what what was that like as an experience? You know, such a such an expansive desert. So amazing. Mm. Um, just it was, and again, you know, we just it was an adventure, and away we went. The, the guy we had two young Englishmen who wanted to open a travel agency in London, and they were the ones that got us together, and they mm. were sort of our guides and drivers. And there was one other Australian guy, Frankie, who was one of the drivers too. And the rest, we were from New Zealand, South Africa and Australia. But mm. um, when we were starting to set off to go across um, from, I think it was Fez, um, the guys didn't think to put extra water or food in. You know, <laughs> we bailed up, the Australians bailed up and said, well, we're not moving until we have extra supplies. Yeah, water. absolutely. <laughs> so old Dennis set off and um, it was amazing. I mean, it was just sand dunes and there was a, a funny old telegraph pole. You couldn't see a road, but that's basically what you followed. And of course we got bogged. We got off, off the said road into the sand and we got bogged and then we waited and finally this funny local bus came by. It had Arabs hanging out the top and there was goats and <laughs> people everywhere and they just thought it was hilarious and they got out and gave us a push and we we got out <laughs> and but the, the amazing thing was the oases mm. you know you'd sort of be in this just sand and nothing and then you'd see these palm trees and you'd think am I you know we knew we were <laughs> the one. and it was absolutely lush green with mm. date palms and the little mud houses and would you believe a coca-cola dispenser always a coca-cola dispenser in these places that's, that's so that's so bizarre because you, you see the cartoons and they always make a joke about it when they're you know they're hallucinating and then they see the oasis and they get there and they do have like a coca-cola machine and I always thought that this was just part of the comical joke but you're saying they were there they were there <laughs> I couldn't believe it but the well and the water and this little tiny lush oasis and then we mm. set off again through the sand and the <laughs> <laughs> dust and when we arrived in America my god we just spent <laughs> days in the desert and we used to just sleep on do our lilos and sleep under the stars which was beautiful but one night it rained can you believe <laughs> but just lying out there and the silence and the stars it was quite mm. incredible oh it absolutely absolutely but then we had an experience where <laughs> we were chugging along and Dennis and uh, one of the local we only saw the two local buses that went past with its chooks and dogs and everything else and Arabs and they're all waving their hands and and they were hanging up with all this um clothing mm. and and one girl said that's my swimming costume and like, wow, that's my suitcase and the back of the bus had obviously jutted open <laughs> And our stuff was everywhere and they were in stitches. So they stopped and they, they gave us our stuff back and we offered them a reward and they went, no, 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 no. But we had to go back 12 miles to pick up all our stuff scattered. <laughs> that was a bit of a laugh. A little bit of a, a, little bit of a desert cookie, cookie <laughs> trail. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> a bit of a laugh. So, so you mentioned the name Dennis um, for, the, for the bus. So where did that name come about? come about you know why, why did you call the bus Dennis I think it was Dennis the menace <laughs> <laughs> Dennis was three days late we we the three or four of us actually went to um, Paris to meet it at the camping ground because they were running late mm. and we didn't know that it had to have a new engine 
before we even started. So we thought, well, that's probably a good thing. So it was three hours. I think it was Dennis the Menace because he <laughs> continuously let us down and broke down and oh, it was a horror. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness and it's, it's really interesting to kind of because you, you do sort of like you see these adventures and that kind of thing um like uh uh the kool-aid acid test where they all sort of like get into a into a bus and it's just it's just that kind of as soon as you're in a bus it's like mayhem breaks <laughs> loose so um it, what what sort of mayhem kind of kind of happened in in that uh, in, in the journeys of that that, that bus? I think um, I think well we had these two big great big army tents that were on the roof. Mm. So to begin with, we had sort of team A and team B and a bit competitive. Mm. And there were six of us in that group in our group, and then there was sort of yeah, six and so so it was it divided in half for the first <laughs> few weeks. It took us forever to get these tents up, <laughs> and that was fun. And, and we were being competitive, and then we had our lilos. So we'd stand there in the camping ground pumping our lilos, and I mean, it did look comical. And then <laughs> put them all inside, but the bus itself it just kept breaking down in mm. Granada. Um, outside the beautiful Alhambra Palace, we um, were parked, went parking in the parking lot. Mm. And uh, naturally, it wasn't as busy as it is these days, but it was busy. And this yeah, beautiful, yeah. beautiful um, palace. And Dennis, I don't know, I'm not very mechanical. I think the, the starter button, something jammed. Mm. And we were all bailed out and Dennis started roaring like a, it just kept the, the engine just roaring and black smoke's pouring out and we're saying it's going to blow up. <laughs> Luckily Frank sort of it actually had flames and, and Frank actually got in and turned the fuel off somehow so that sort of settled down but it was a mm. bit embarrassing in front of the Alhambra Palace and the, all the time, <laughs> this old bomb of a bus with black smoke and flames pouring out. So we decided we were just going to leave it to the men. We'd just leave it. So they finally fixed that. Mm. And, um, and then in Granada, um, going around the main piazza, Frankie was driving. He was a bit blind. He had really thick yeah. clothes. <laughs> and he took a corner of it in the main um, piazza. And there were these beautiful terracotta pots all around the edge with geraniums. And he yeah. just cut the lot out and just <laughs> wow. scratched the lot. So they were all smashed. So the policeman arrived and we had to pay a big fine. And so that was it. And um, oh, finally, Dennis just fell apart. Um, uh -huh. And we bailed out in Bergen. Six yeah. Years. We, yeah. we brought the ferry back. And then there was another, the other seven carried on a little bit longer. And I think they just parked it by the road and went back to England. <laughs> <laughs> just finally, but it's done an amazing. We went right up to the tip of Norway, yeah, uh, to watch the midnight sun. We're supposed to go to Russia, but because Poland had been invaded, um, mm. didn't get through sadly because I was so interested in Russian history and I'm lucky to have had a couple of trips since. But um, so we went right up to the tip of Norway, and you know, he, he did do pretty well when you look at it, but there were yeah. kind of breakdowns and, and punctures. And, um, a, a fan belt went and something else it's, it was just pretty constant yeah so that's that's actually going to loop back to my next to my next question um because you know as you say uh dennis finally gave up the ghost <laughs> at one point and you spent six days in the sahara so what was the contingency plan if dennis broke down in the middle of the desert. They didn't have one. No one. <laughs> <laughs> this no. is the naivety, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> totally. Exactly. Because I mean, like today, you know, possibly, you know, depending on, on yeah. reception, you had a mobile phone. No. Back back then, yeah. if it breaks down in the middle of the desert. Yeah. And we only wow. saw two two local you know, buses full of people go past in that time. So yeah, in total ignorance, we were stupid. Oh. <laughs> but we did have extra water and food on. <laughs> oh well, yes, it, it would have been. It could the the, the novel could it were, it could have definitely have turned from an adventure into a survival a uh, thriller. <laughs> <laughs> in, in, the, so in, the, in the blink of an eye. So um, with you know, with the book itself, what what sort of elements 
do you think make for really good writing? You know, I mean, like, obviously something like Innocent Nurses Abroad is just absolutely jam packed with adventure, but how do you, what, what elements make, make that story great? I think it's the personal side. I, mm. I think the, the deep friendships um, that are still my greatest friends, the nursing yeah. friendships and what you share together. And I think sharing that year away like we did is even more so. Um, and I think a love story sort of... Ah, <laughs> uh, yes, of course. Add to it. I know one <laughs> of my um, dear friends who, who edited my first book, McAllister, he said, we need conflict and we need a love story. And I went, oh, well... <laughs> bring conflict in if there's none. Anyway, there is a love story in this one where I fell in love with Rick 10 days before I left. And yeah. um, that was very intense. And then I met um, Dougal on the ship and I thought, well, that was just a fun shipboard romance. Mm. But when I arrived back from um, the Dennis saga, um, he invited me to Scotland to a, um, an international McPherson scan, a um, um, clan reunion. Ah. <laughs> it was an honor and I thought oh that's but I'd love to go to that that'll be a real experience so I did and um and he was just charming and um I just thought wow you know if I hadn't met Rick before I left this would have been a real challenge because the, yeah. the, the love sort of developed and I was very torn I called it my love barometer because <laughs> <laughs> in the meantime, had moved to McAllister, this remote cattle station. And so not a lot of mail or no telephone or anything, of course. And there was Dougal with flowers and wine and lovely restaurants. And so my love barometer <laughs> sort of went from Scotland to the Gulf of Carpentaria. And it was a dilemma for me. But um, anyway, I, I came, I told him about Rick and I came home and it was pretty rocky for a while. I was just trying to, if I had any money, I would have gone back to Scotland. <laughs> it all ironed out in the end. <laughs> oh, good. And I think yeah. that creates interest in, I think, a personal, I think, and again, I'm, I'm such a, a novice writer. Mm -hmm. As I said, when I wrote um, Back of Beyond McAllister, which was the first edit edition, um, I didn't think for a minute that that would be a success uh, for other people. Yeah. So, it's yeah. a surprise and I've always loved writing but I've never prioritized it and but now I'm a lot more mature at writing I've learned so much through the mm. publishers and through, I'm on a mentoring program with the publisher now and so I think um descriptions as as they say you must paint the picture about mm. people and the situation yeah. and I think that's important to keep the reader's interest exactly so um, you've, you've piqued my interest again, just in just in terms of character development. So um, certainly, with with some novelists who don't write from, uh, you know, like a background of, of something that's actually real, you know, it all comes out of their out of their um, imagination. The characters are, can, on occasion, just be extensions of the author. Do you find that? With the people that you meet in your in your life, are they more vibrant? You know, does it just make it easier and the characters come to life and flourish much more um, than something that's artificially created? I think so. I find I observe a lot much more now. Mm. I observe people and I think I can use those those traits in, in writing. I think you're quite right. That's a very interesting point because mm. I'm a lot more observant now. And I've met since living at the Gold Coast, which is such a change from the bush. Mm. Um, I've met a very eclectic group of, of friends and uh, they're very, um, they're inspiring because mm. the, most of my friends and they're still my friends are from the country. Um, but here I've met people from all walks of life and different political views and all sorts of things. So it's made me a, a lot more observant in writing mm -hmm. and describing characters. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, and as you said, with the love barometer, you know, <laughs> like um, when, when you have these love triangles that are artificially created, uh, when you read them, it's sort of you don't feel invested in it and you don't feel that what's happening is actually real but when it comes from a personal event there's that 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 actual um the empathy is drawn out 
uh, in innocent nurses abroad. So you can kind of feel this, oh, what's she going to do? This is such a such a massive decision for her to, to kind of make considering that she's overseas and there's things happening in Scotland. <laughs> it was. <laughs> <laughs> it was a good dilemma. I mean, how exciting. How lucky was I to have loved two great men? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> we introduced, we actually met in, in, uh, in England, in Devon um, in 1986. And I knew that Rick and Dougal would just hit it off. I mean, yeah. I had not been there. They just hit it off. They had a wonderful chat. Yes. <laughs> he married a nurse and he has two sons exactly the same age as our two boys. So the universe is interesting, isn't it? It, it is. It is. Absolutely. Especially because, uh, so uh, I don't know whether I'm crossing a line here. No. Um, so uh, the, the, with this love barometer and considering that uh, you're saying that when they met, they got along, do you have a type? Um, they're quite different. Yeah. But yeah, I think there is definitely similar. <laughs> similar. Yeah, I think I do have a type. That's a very mm. good way of putting it. I think so. I'm um, definitely. Yeah. Uh, the attraction was, you know, their personalities, their outlook on life, their fun side. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So, of course, when they get together, they're going to get along. Just have it all. <laughs> His, Dougal's wife wasn't quite so pleased to be there, which I can absolutely understand. I mean, why would she? But she was very sweet. Exactly, exactly. Once, once you get too many personalities into a situation, of course, there's going to be yeah, yeah, yeah issues that, that arise out of that. Yes. Um, so, like, it, in the book itself, who, who were you most connected to um I, I suppose other than like the uh um the love interests who who was the platonic connection in that in that book for you um, probably um my nursing friend d she was the one i really connected with mm. uh, there were a lot of people in our little flat in london there were people coming and going the whole time so lots of lots of good friends who bunked mm. down until they found a place and it was just constant. We were doing night duty when we were there. So there'd be, the beds would be used in the day and then at night and mm. it was a constant <laughs> flow. In fact, there was um, a house just two doors down that had a 24 hour police guard. Mm. And, and we used to you know, just talk to the policeman when we came back from night duty in the morning. And one morning my bed was under the window and there was a knock on the window about three o'clock in the morning, and this policeman, and he said, what is going on? He thought we were running a house of ill repute. <laughs> What's going on in here? The people coming in like, the whole time. But it was, sorry, to answer your question, mm. um, Dee, one of my nursing friends, was uh, the one probably that she was sort of a bushy too. And yeah, yeah. We, we were all close, but she was the one probably I was close yeah, to, the yeah. one Are I was you... home with. Are you still close with her now? Sadly, she passed away two years ago. Yes, oh, okay. no, we were okay. we were very close. Yes, I yeah. miss those conversations. And yeah. she, she had a brain tumor, and right until about three weeks before she died, I was in hospital with her, visiting her, and she was telling me stories to wow. put in the book. You know, it was yeah, amazing. yeah, yeah. Oh, that's that's so awesome, and it's really wonderful to hear uh, hear about Dee uh, and and her adventures uh, in the yeah, book in the book great. as well. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, so I do have a question here from uh, one of the uh, people, and it is in terms of, so she's writing a memoir. Yes. And she's noticed your web presence and, and she's very, very impressed with, with your web presence. And she mm -hmm. kind of asks, well, how, how does she create that kind of, of similar web presence whereby people kind of like see it and they're drawn to it and they want to know the story, not only the stories you write, but that magnetism that you have as well? Uh, thank you. Um, my publisher, Ocean Reeve, did my web page for me. I'm not very technically advanced, I'm afraid, but it's a, it's a, um, it's something I have not been greatly comfortable with is mm. I have an author Facebook page as well as an ordinary Facebook page and Instagram and LinkedIn. Mm. I haven't found LinkedIn to be a great help because it's more a business thing and my, my 
things are trivial. Um, but I write a fortnightly blog and my publisher puts that on my web page. And I think that keeps interest. And I, I put that on Facebook, on mm -hmm. page of Facebook and Instagram. And I also do a short book reading of about three minutes on video and put that on my web page too and YouTube. Mm -hmm. And I'm not comfortable with this constant um, putting things on about myself, but I think it's terribly important. Um, I, I do a mentoring, um, a mentoring program with Ocean Reef Publishing with mm. about 50 other authors. And he's very strong on social media and just, especially with COVID because mm. I'm my best when I'm person to person. So I found that marketing this book really difficult, but as he said, it's a slow burn. And I think just keeping that constant, putting on your author page, little snippets, if you have a photo of somebody um, that you've met who's bought a book or yeah, yeah. And then keeping your other uh, Facebook page is a more personal, but I still do share things on that as well. So I think it's just that, just keep going. Every fortnight I do a blog and every fortnight I do a short book reading, a video. I think video is very personal because you actually see the people. Even yeah, they to do. <laughs> yeah, ex exactly, exactly. Um, now I'm going I'm to ask a question um, that some, sometimes the authors are a little, uh, you know, they, they answer it, but they don't really answer it in that technical side of things because, you know, you, you can say, oh, um, what does this take? And then they'll go like, oh, it takes this long. But they kind of gloss over the <laughs> hard stuff because a lot of a lot of the time, if you say these things, it can dissuade someone because they're like, oh, my goodness, that's, yeah. that's just too much. Yeah. Um, so how long did it take you to write the book? Uh, and in that, could you talk a little bit about the editing process mm -hmm. um, and also how long the editing process takes? I'm very happy to do that. And also, if anybody wants to contact me, please tell them to feel welcome to talk mm. anymore. So um, I, could, I can give people your email address? I do. I'm very Brilliant. happy to chat personally with anyone that got questions. And I'll be honest, um, my first book took probably 10 years. Um, <laughs> it just because I didn't prioritize, it went on and on and on. And then to edit it, uh, I independently published McAllister. Um, the editing took a year with mm. a friend who is an editor and then the publishers edited it again and and then when I got the contract with Alan and Unwin to change mm. the name and the cover they said we'll republish in 12 months time and I went oh my gosh what what does that mean and that 12 months was editing again I had three editors yeah and I learned so much it was so good it was more about timeline it was legal things it was just they just picked out little things because it had been edited well. But um, so that was 12 months and that mm. was pretty solid work because the editor would send me through and there'd be the, all those red marks. I thought, my God, I've got all this wrong and I had to answer. So that took 12 months. Um, I found the editing and, and with, sorry, Innocent Nurses Abroad, it took me, I focused more on that. Yeah. And it took me 12 months to write and the editing on that, was probably another 12 months mm. and that includes the photos and the cover you know just getting it together um the editing i enjoyed but i found it really at the end of it i just didn't ever want to look at the book read it hear it <laughs> because you're not looking at it as, as a as a story you're just dissecting all the little bits and yeah. it's so finicky and you just you're just sick of it and mm. so probably then you probably need to just put it away for a little while and have a break but apart from that I learned so much through the editing process and I enjoyed it but as far as the book was concerned I just didn't want to know about it it was just I was so sick of it I was so utterly sick of it <laughs> the interesting thing was with McAllister my first one I did an audio book and um, I had a friend who's a professional um, 
Rita and I thought, oh, she offered to do it for nothing. And I mm. told Ocean Reeve and he said, no, you have to do it. <laughs> and that was the most amazing experience because I was in a little little room, it took me nine days reading three hours a day. Mm. And I, I actually read that as a book. And that was yeah. sort of, oh, it was so enlightening. And the technician would stop between chapters and I'd have a drink of water and she'd either be looking around in tears or she'd mm. be looking around in tears from laughter. <laughs> and I thought, that's just affecting her. And for me, that was the most, because I haven't read them since, that was the most wonderful experience, just to read it as a book, as a yeah. read. Yeah, yeah, ab ab absolutely. Because I think, and I, and I don't know, I honestly don't know why it is um, how some authors, because I love what you just said, and I don't understand why some authors kind of have that tendency to say it takes this long to write and then there's the editing process and they, they sort of hide the editing process. So, <laughs> simply because it's... I learn so much through it. And yeah, I really exactly. Because as you say, like it is a, it's a year to write and that's the enjoyable creative kind yes. of, you know, it just sort of comes out and everything like that. And then there's this year of intense hard slog to essentially sculpt that uh that book into into something that the publishers look at and go this is this yeah. is enough now and yeah. now we're gonna edit it <laughs> and i i also think to add to that it's the most important thing you have to do mm. honestly the editing is vital yeah ab absolutely so it i guess this is the, the follow-on for, for that. Percentage-wise, what percentages would you look at in terms of, um, you know, like in, importance? So the percentage for the writing of the novel itself and then the percentage for the editing of that novel? Because I know editing is massive. 90% editing, 10% mm. writing, I really do. Because you mm. can put quite a scrambled manuscript to an editor and they can turn it. But the... the tidier it is before you go to editing the better yeah i enjoyed that re edit rewriting and editing myself but it was mm, not mm. i just think the editing is vital yeah, yeah. Ab absolutely and and I, that that's what i really love to hear because mm. I, I think if people know that it is 10 percent creation and then 90 percent refining it down um, it gives people a real understanding in in terms of um, writing as a career. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that for that insight. Um, and just a, just a quick one in in terms of uh, inspiration. What are you reading at the moment? Is it the types of novels that or the types of books that you like? Do they do they feed into your writing or are they completely separate? Um, I'm, re I'm reading a book called The Governess, which is about Marion Crawford, the governess to Queen Elizabeth. I like reading, it's actually a novel, but it's based on fact, obviously, but I like mm. reading biographies. I like true oh, yeah. stories. Yeah. Or I like historical fiction. Um, so yeah, I do, I, I'm probably not the feeding into it because I'm starting to write a fiction at the moment, which is okay. Um, I, I find that I'm looking at the style of writing and how different writers are approaching it, keeping the interest. I find, because I'm a fast reader, I find if I lose interest, I think, right, why? Was it too descriptive mm. or, you know, I'm analysing, not, not analysing, but I'm, I'm observing. Yeah. Learning. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, all the time learning. <laughs> exactly. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to uh, see if there's any questions, any questions out there from people. Put your hand up if you have a question. So I'll just give them a little time, bit of time to, uh, to type that in. And um, I'll, uh, let's see how they go. Oh yes, they're, they're typing away, typing away now. That's good. So you, you're mentioning you're writing a new book. <laughs> yeah, I'm starting a fiction, which is weird. And it's, I don't know where it's going to go. And I don't know, if I'll probably never publish it. But it's, it's, um, it's amazing because after writing um, nonfiction, you just sort of let your mind go. So it's a bit of fun. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So uh, um, in terms of characters, 
considering the characters work so well in Innocent Nurses Abroad, um, even though, as you say, it's fiction, are you going to draw from actual people? No, they're no. bizarrely different. <laughs> <laughs> a French heiress and, a, and an Australian businessman. We are very different. That's so strange. <laughs> Have you got a title for it? No. Oh, well, I think... Um, yeah, no, I haven't yet. Something about as the wine flows or something like that. It's oh, a, brilliant, brilliant. A in France. Yeah, it, yeah. It may never come to light, but it's a bit funny. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got you've got like the scenery set up and, mm. and all that kind of thing. Oh, that that's yeah. great. Yeah. Oh, okay, so here we go. So we hang on. So we've got uh, here the comment on the length of editing. Uh, recently, um, Chappelle Corby had written and published her book in a really short period of time. So any idea why that, why that would be? And, um, you know, to, to be honest, I think like uh, sometimes <clears throat> you do see novels well not novels but books that that seemingly you know something happens in the media and then the next thing you know bang the the book is out and it comes out in a really short period of time so do you have any idea in terms of like why that would occur I think, yeah I, look i agree i think if somebody really sits down and focuses on a per, people that can write you know six or eight or ten hours a day that would be very possible but i think sometimes they've got a ghostwriter too Mm. somebody who they just dictate to and then they write it and edit it and um but otherwise i don't know but i was never one to sit down and spend six or eight or ten hours a day writing i just can't stay inside that long so um possibly if they are that dedicated and can mm. just sit down someone and record or write it it's certainly possible yeah well and and it kind of you know um, from my, uh, not so much my writing experience, but I remember when 9-11 happened and Noam Chomsky published his book on 9-11 and it came out really quickly after the actual event and the critics went to town on it, essentially saying you've written this way too quickly um, and what you've essentially put into, into the book in a month's time from now could be completely different because of the research that, that comes out of it. So sometimes, yeah, when, when these books come out really quickly uh, in terms of something that's that's happened, uh, they, they just seem rushed. And, and for me, um, particularly with the Chappelle Corby book, is you're riding a wave and you want to make money off that particular book. And if the story is no longer relevant in a year's time, no one's going to buy it. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah, so sometimes it's timing and marketing and that kind of thing yeah. that flows into it as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's why I was lucky with um, Back of Beyond. The genre for people wanting to read Australian stories was very high. Mm. Uh, it just hit that time. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. So we're coming up to the hour mark. So I just want to finish this on... Where can we buy your book, Jenny? Where, where, <laughs> yeah. where is Innocent Nurses Abroad? Do you have a copy that you could hold up and show us? I just happen to have one. Oh, lovely. <laughs> um, it's available on my website, mm -hmm. which is www.jennyold.com. Oh, just a lowercase. All through my publisher, oceanreefpublishing.com. And if anybody would like to chat to me or... Or speak to me, any of your like people in the library, please. I, I'm very happy to. Oh, great. So I'm just making sure I've got the... There we go. So I'll pop that into the chat as well. There's www.jennyold.com. And I can see you've got a few books in there, Back of Beyond, Innocent Nurses Abroad, and McAllister, the... Uh, the audio book and it'll be interesting because the next one could possibly be a fiction novel oh, i've got so <laughs> many in my head could be <laughs> excellent yes it's all good uh, 
But thank okay. you so much for having me, Stephen. I really appreciate it. And I'm sorry we couldn't hear Gordon properly in Florence, but it's lovely to have you there. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. It's been a wonderful experience. You're an astounding author. I love your work and I certainly hope to... Uh, to hear from your next book and have another have another author talk i'd like to thank everyone for coming and uh, jenny old thank you very thank much you. thank you very much thank you Stephen. excellent bye everybody bye bye everyone <laughs>